All right, we will now shift gears to this big landmark judgment uh, over the issue of uh, local government autonomy. The federal government are taking uh, the states to court through the Attorney General of the Federation. And the Attorney General of the Federation, Latifa Gwemiesian, has actually gotten judgment. And we want to have that conversation uh, with the legal mind. Uh, the former chairman of the uh, National Human Rights uh, Commission, Professor Chidiodin Kahlo. But before that, let, let me show you a few things uh, that has to do with this particular judgment. So if, we, if my producer can take me to the very first uh, slide on this particular one that has to do with what the contention is. So, okay, let me just say basically uh, on this particular issue, uh, there are a couple of uh, legislation. So this particular one has to do with the principle of, of allocation. So if we go to the next slide, uh, you see where the contention is. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Let's see. All right, if you hold it here, 162 subsection 3, any amount standing to the credit of the Federation account shall be distributed among the federal and state governments and the local government council in each state on such terms and in such manner as may be prescribed by the National Assembly. I just needed, to, I needed you to see that provision of the Constitution, which is one of the premises of the decision of the Supreme Court today. There are other sub that has to do with the local government and the states. So what happens is that the, when we make money as a federation, it goes into the federation account. Then they share the money among the three tiers of government. The federal government takes theirs. So for instance, in May, the federal government took about 360 something billion. The state government took about 388 billion. The local government took about 280 80 something billion and then 13% derivation by 100 billion. But what happens is that when it gets to the state, is the federal, is the state and the local government account into what they call JAC, Joint Account Allocation Committee. That is where the crisis began. So the federal government is saying, the states are not doing enough to allow the local government run government independently as a tier of government. So they want to separate it. So now it's not going to JAC, it's going to go straight from the federal government directly to the local government account. That's why we're having this conversation. I'm being joined in the program by Professor Chidio Dinkalo, uh, former chairman of the National Human Rights Commission. Prof, thank you so much for your patience and for coming on the program. Thank you for having me, my brother. Good evening. Uh, well, so I, my, my first question to you, is this one kind of a chokehold of the neck of good governance? Some people say perpetuated by governors. Is this how you will characterize the situation and the judgment of the court today? Uh, I, I want to be quite clear. I've not seen the judgment, and I refrain as a matter of principle from commenting on judgments I've not read. Mm. Um, so I will not comment on what the Supreme Court is reported to have said today. Um, and uh, having said that, I, I don't think that the issues are as easily compartmentalized as is as people would like to report. I think the, the question of local government accounts and what happens to them is a little more complex than we try to make out. Uh, go, go ahead. Uh, we're listening to you, sir. Now, you see, this, this you've got to step back a little. Uh, this is not just about taking money, you know, sending money to local governments. This is about how we derive the legitimacy of the mandate to govern in Nigeria. And here, the Supreme Court has to be held responsible for generating very squalid jurisprudence that has given us bandit elections. All right? Elections are lacking in legitimacy as a result of what the Supreme Court has done. Not today but over the years since at least 2003. And as a result, it is difficult to see a situation in which local government chairpersons who are the products of CX that are totally owned by the state governors can really be autonomous. Because most of them, with a few exceptional exceptions with a few outliers most of them lack the legitimacy that they can trade in for the authority to call the state governors to order without understanding that i think we we commit grievous error thinking that 
sending money straight to local government chairpersons will all of a sudden create what does not exist. So in your view, I know that yeah, personally too, and a lot of people like yourself who are luminaries in this space uh, would not want to comment on judgment they've not seen the CTC. It gives us a guide as to the reasoning of the Lord justices uh, to be able to know exactly how they arrived at their conclusion or their judgment. Uh, but in your view, um, how necessary is this judgment in the long run? Let's start from there. Frankly, I don't think the issue is where the money goes to. The question in my view is how legitimate is the mandate of the person to whom the money goes to? I'll give you an example. In 2017, Benue State organized uh, local government elections. The elections took place on a Saturday. On the, modern, on the morning, the following morning on a Sunday, the chairperson of the Benue State Independent Electoral Commission announced that the ruling party, which was the eight, uh, APC then, had won all the seats and uh, the, all the seats and offices that were contested in that election. And when he was asked what the tallies were, he said they were still tallying. How do you tally the, how do you announce outcome of a result of an election in which the tallies had not yet been done? Now, if you are elected as a local government chairperson from that kind of election, you don't have the legitimacy to tell the governor, I will not send you the money that I have received from Abuja. Okay? This is the problem. And where does that come from? It comes from the Supreme Court giving jurisprudence that says elections are things in which anything can go. That is entirely at the doorstep of the Supreme Court. And so what am I saying? The, what, the Supreme Court cannot say on the one hand you can organize anything and call it elections. And on the other hand, well, send money directly to the local government areas or local government councils. Those two streams of jurisprudence are entirely at odds with one another. Illegitimate mandates lead to lack of democratic dividends. And illegitimate mandates, I don't know, if you were in Abuja yesterday, did you see that all the politicians, all important politicians in the country were attending the swearing in of judges by the chief justice? Do you know why? Because the people who have the votes to put politicians in office now are no longer the voters, are no longer citizens like you and I. It is the judges. That is where the politicking takes place. The, the, the tyranny of illegitimate mandates created by the jurisprudence of this Supreme Court makes renders the judgment they have given today hollow in my view quite pirate so i can understand so are you referring to the 2023 election to be precise because i see that you keep going back i understand what you're saying as, a, as, as to the fact that look uh before we jump to the issue of the monies let's talk about the mandate of the people that will receive the money or otherwise so are you referring to the 2023 election to be precise on this particular one? So we'll get the frame of reference. You heard me, you heard me say beginning from at least 2003 elections. I was very specific. I said beginning from at least 2003 elections. It didn't start. It, this is not an, an event. It's been a cascade to where we are now. And I gave you the example of Benue State 2017. And so I'm not here to really, if you get stuck in one incident, I can't help you. But I think it is because all of us are Nigerians. I'm not going to come to your program and start lying to you and start saying things I don't believe in. Because if anybody picks me up, I want to say I believe in what I say. If you want to kill me, shoot me. And I'm telling you that the Supreme Court is responsible for illegitimate mandates and coming to tell us where money goes is irresponsible of the Supreme Court. How do you mean that is irresponsible of them? Because this is the apex court. Whatever decision comes from the court, there's the argument as to uh, how it is perceived, I'm a the, citizen, biases, no. the outcome, and all of that. So now they are I'm a citizen a of Nigeria so by birth. Judgment? Uh, I'm a citizen of Nigeria by descent. Mm. I'm a citizen of Nigeria by choice. What these people do affects me as a Nigerian. And so when I speak as a Nigerian, I don't yield. It is irresponsible, on the one hand, to tell us that anything can go as an election. 
that elections can be conducted without standards. Go back and read the judgment of the Supreme Court in Buhari against Sierra Dua from 2008. That exactly is what the Supreme Court decided. Okay? They decided that you could organize elections without serialized ballot papers. They decided that elections did not have to be governed by underlying principles with respect to credibility. All right. Nikki Toby delivered that judgment. When you read that judgment, mm -hmm. and then you read the consequences that have followed since then, you will understand why I am saying what I am saying. That when you have created a jurisprudence of illegitimate mandates, you cannot then expect local governments that are accountable. But that is as a matter of fact, you okay. cannot expect politicians that are accountable at any level. That is why the country is being pauperized, because politicians who lack legitimate mandates cannot give you democratic dividend. Let, 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 let's, 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 let's move on to say that this has been decided by court. The 2023 elections, all of the elections that you're referencing, you said at least 2023 election. Uh, they'll be decided by the apex no i said at when... least no 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 sir i said at least 2003 elections not 2023 yes. at okay. least 2003 that is over okay, 2000 years ago okay uh, I, my apologies so let's say all of that has been decided now we are moving forward given what we have on our hands so as much as you haven't seen the ctc i understand that but the preliminary uh, conversation is the fact that monies can now go to local government. How, is, how should we be expecting this to be executed for the good of the people at the end of the day? Because the situation that has to do with the governors on one hand, sometimes you can't hold them to account. The, uh, the House of Assembly arguably appendages to the governor, and now we have these resources in the hands of local authority. How should Nigeria approach this in ensuring that, according, as, according to what the president has said, look, the people must hold the local government's account to account to ensure that the monies are spent judiciously for the good of the people, in your view. You see, this is the problem. We like to move ahead uh, without looking, looking at where we're coming from. It's not possible, my brother. Huh? That is exactly why we're here. And then when you ask the person, they say, oh, we leave it to God. God does not vote in Nigeria. God is not a registered voter. God does not work in INEC. God is not a police officer. God does not rig elections. Human beings do. So we cannot move forward from things that are dreadful because those are the consequences that we get as president. And those are the consequences that, those are the outcomes that started us with the consequences that we live with. As I said, if you go to give this money now, to a local government chairperson who has been installed, installed in a rigged election, controlled entirely by the governor. What this person is going to do is collect the money and hand it back to the governor. So all you're doing is altering the sequence uh, by which the money gets back to the governor, but the money will still get back to the governor. And the reason the money will still get back to the governor is because the mandate, as a matter of jurisprudence, set up by the Supreme Court, is not with the people. The mandate is with the politicians and the judges. Until we address that, we are wasting time devoting too much effort to uh, Prop, passing Prop, this jurisprudence that I have not read. I understand you perfectly, Prof. One of the things that the Supreme Court said today is the fact that for local government that don't have democratically elected officials, money should not be sent to them. Which is why I'm asking you that question, how we can save that. So on one hand, the court has done its bidding to say, if you're a caretaker committee or whatever name or appendages or whatever nomenclature you go by, if you're not elected, forget about this money. Federal government don't send it to them. That's on one hand. Now you've alluded to the fact that uh, it's just going to be a change of schemings. Uh, the, the local government may collect the money and give it back to the governor. My question is, how do we safeguard that? It is up to the politicians. Look. Uh, you know, the president now went through the same thing with Obasanjo when Obasanjo held up their monies. If that is the consequence of when he was governor of Lagos State, if that is the consequence they want to live with or they want to afflict others with, by all means, you see, the thing about politics is that, we, you know, you live by the swings of the pendulum. Sooner or later, this thing will come around. Uh, it may take one decade, it may take 20, dec uh, you know, 20 years, but it's going to turn around.
and uh, the you know the 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 the, the incidents of impact will be some somewhere else probably on the people inflicting it today uh 20 years ago it was pdp doing the inflicting today it is the apc doing the inflicting the problem until we settle the origins of the mandate to set up government until we address the legitimacy of the political authority at all levels federal state and local that people lay claims to on the basis of which to administer our public, uh, the public good and the commonwealth, we are going to be dealing with all these band aids. What has come out today, in my view, is worse than a confection band aid, if you ask me. So how should local government be funded in your view? And what should now be the relationship between local government and state now that this is what is in our hands? We are in a, in a nice symmetrical conversation. You're focused on funding of local government. I'm focused on the legitimacy of those who exercise power in order to use that money. And I'm telling you that as long as the legitimacy is fractured and fundamentally and structurally flawed on the basis of Supreme Court jurisprudence, you cannot, the conversation as to funding of local government is not very helpful. Because howsoever that money comes, if the legitimacy is not founded in the will, in the legitimate will of the people, that money is going to be funneled back into the same corrupt criminal franchises that we have today masquerading as different levels of power. And therefore, there will be no the beneficiation, the democratic beneficiation that we are expecting to inure in favor of the people will not happen. And I am sure that, that on that, both of you can agree. Uh, both of us can agree that what we're looking for here is how best to look after the interests of our people. And if local government worked, local government were legitimate, that would happen. But if local government is not legitimate, that will not happen. Prof, of, of course, we're going to have that conversation about this issue of legitimacy and the uh, issue of jurisprudence and the calls of court, as far as our elections are concerned on this particular matter. Uh, but I know that you would like to speak on one more issue. Uh, and, the, and you mentioned it in passing. Uh, the reason I, I wanted you to explore this issue of the, the finances of local government, which is quite important because we've not seen this done in a very long time. And now uh, we're still talking about the issue of the elections, which is totally fine. But we understand where you're coming from. But let's talk about something you have mentioned in passing. The issue of, I know you retweeted something from a gentleman called Joseph Onora. The man said, uh, many of those sworn in yesterday as court of appeal judges, a worrisome number are first level politically exposed persons at filial dimensions, what is it that makes wives and immediate friends of politicians the most suitable for a highest court? Now, it's a bit of a dilemma. If somebody is qualified to occupy the court and is related to a politically exposed person, uh, should that person backtrack because of the politically, politically exposed persons, because of the fear of what we have in our polity? The question is, what does being qualified mean? That's the question we've got to address. So I'll give you an example. Um, the wife of Yahya Bello was, was cleared by the State Judicial Service Commission in Kogi State to be appointed a judge of the Kogi State High Court. She had never practiced as a lawyer. She had never taught. She had never researched. She had never administered courts. Um, the one thing she had administered uh, to the best of her ability was the bedroom of her husband. And the only thing that precluded her from being appointed ultimately by the National Judicial Council recommended for appointment was that her husband fell out with, um, you know what, under what circumstances. I'm not going to go into the details of that here. Now, uh, but was she qualified? Of course she was qualified. What are qualifications? You've been a lawyer admitted to practice for 10 years. You know the number of people who make that threshold? So the idea that somehow the only people in now who are qualified to be judges are people found in the bedrooms of, polit of politicians, senior politicians, or the bedrooms uh, of senior judges is utterly nonsensical. Utterly nonsensical. Now you look at the list that has been produced of new judges of the city high court. Eight of them out of 12, over 60, about 60%, are the children of serving or, re or recently retired judges. How do you, how mathematically, 
statistically, how possible is that? All right, so, so this is a, a, an utterly rigged process of, of mutual in, intercourse between politicians and judges. The politicians rely on the judges to get them into office. The judges rely on politicians to advance them into transactions. This well, is I, I, entirely what it is. And well, it is I, I, I understand. I understand you, may, you will hold your opinion, and that is totally respected. But I, I wanted to be safe around not impugning on the integrity of the entire institution, given the practices of some. Uh, but before I let you go, sir... Just, I'm not impugned on anybody. I am giving you proportions and numbers. I said there are 12 people who were... I've not abused anybody here. I've not laid, uh, laid, any, laid any hand on anybody's integrity. I'm just giving you the facts. And the facts... You see, this is the problem here. Even the facts you're afraid of. You're afraid of these facts because these facts only... No, 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 no I'm, not, I'm not afraid of any facts. I'm a journalist. I'm not... No, I'm not afraid of facts. I'm no. just... You explaining see, the position of the, the conversation. Facts. All right, Prof. I, the I, there's a question. Only there's one a question. Conclusion. This yes. is a corrupt system. Well, yes. The, the, the opinions are divergent depending on who you're listening to. So I cannot be a court of law uh, to myself on the program. My job is to ask questions, which I'm asking you, and we respect your opinion as well. But yeah. I needed to be clear on the integrity of the entire institution. But, Prof, there's one question I would like you to answer for me before we go. Which is, you've mentioned yeah. the fact that based on the jurisprudence you've seen, you're not excited about a couple of things happening, coming from our court. Understood. In an ideal situation where the gray areas and the doubts that you've shown or expressed are taken care of, how should local government be funded? I'm back to that question. But this time, in an ideal situation. I cannot give you an ideal situation because when I'm not Babalawo to live in a real world, the real world is what we've got to try and iron out. And I'm not going to run shy of that real world and start manufacturing an ideal situation that we can't even contemplate and we are unwilling to contemplate. Because that ideal situation we want that begins with local government councils that have political legitimacy, in which the people who exercise leadership at the local government level are directly and lawfully lawfully and manifestly elected by the people. When that happens and you send money to the local government, the persons who run the local government will have the authority to be able to tell governor, no, I am the person who will suffer the political consequences of you trying to steal this money, so I will not do what you want me to do. But if the governor has installed this person in the expectation of a quid pro quo, the person will not have the authority to push back. And that is why this judgment today is worse than a hall of fame. Professor Chidiodi Kalo is a former chairman of the National Human Rights Commission. We must thank you for coming on the program. Thank you. We appreciate you. Thanks, Professor.